Ladies, you can't hide in here. This is the internet. What is going on here? I demand an explanation. This clumsy fool attempted to plant ridiculous historical accuracy on me. This is a fantasy character. That's a damn lie. There are lots of historical details in the book. I read them with my own eyes. Ladies, this is outrageous. I've never heard of such behavior on the internet before. Hello, sweetheart. Hello. I just called up to say goodnight. That was, um, unique. Or at least I hope it was. Um, I haven't filmed it yet. I know that that is a little bit of a weird reference. But for like the 12 of you that knew, it was so worth it for me. Uh, for a change of pace, I wanted to do something a little bit different today. So I'm going to be talking to you all about the project that we're talking about today while I put on the face for what will hopefully be the sketch at the beginning of this video. Oh, uh, and by the way, this is not the greatest angle and frame to be seeing the top half of me in. Suffice it to say, I am modestly covered. But that being said, we're going to do a little bit of chatting uh, about cosplay and costuming. So let's go. All right, so we're going to start with hair. So I've been making historical clothing for about a year and a half, and I've referred to myself as a costumer and a historical costumer, and I've referred to the clothes that I make as historical garments and clothing and all of that jazz. Up until now, I didn't really think of myself as a cosplayer. And so what I'm about to say is actually based on personal experience. There are no real hard and fast definitions here. Everybody's experience can vary and differ. Don't anybody think that what I'm talking about here has anything to do with hard and fast definitions? That's gonna have to get done again, shoot. So you do you, man. Like, whatever kind of costuming you do, it's costuming, and that's cool. So why wasn't I cosplaying? What about my costumes didn't count as cosplay in my sort of personal definition of the term? I don't think I really fully knew until I started this LA Enchanted project. I wasn't only making a gown, not just in the sense of I was also making accessories, but in the sense that I was creating a character, a fully fledged real character from a book. And I didn't just look for clothing clues when I was in there, I was also looking for things like colors and themes and ideas and concepts that are explored in the novel. Anything I could use to inform choices that I made. That's the important word is choices. So like what kind of materials would I be using? Why would I go with one texture over another? When you're creating a garment or making a style of garment without a specific person in mind, those choices are totally different. And it's not to say that they're more or less numerous. They're just not the same. Um, so like, for instance, when I opted for one fabric over the other, I wasn't just asking myself, is this what they would use in the 17th century? I was also asking myself, would Ella wear this? Would this be the choice that she made? I think I talked about that a little bit when I said in the last video that red isn't her color. Like, that's a choice that doesn't mean anything in the 17th century, but definitely means something to Ella Enchanted. That made a difference. It made my brain work in a way that was totally different, and I loved it. I actually had so much fun with it. Cosplay, even as a subset of costuming generally, has enormous sub-subsets. Like, I wasn't building a movie character into a different time period or making a screen-accurate costume. By the way, folks who can do that, kudos to you, that sounds hard. <laughs> but uh, I'm not even doing historical reenactment like you do with the SCA. Oh, uh, for those of you who are wondering, I am not really doing any particular uh, hairstyle or look. This is me making it up as I go based on some very vague understanding of what I want it to look like in the end. Uh, don't quote me on this being something that's going to work out because I don't even know if it's going to work out. This is my first time doing it. I'm going to finish up these curls in a slightly more uh, speedy fashion and then we'll reconvene. All right, so now that I am entirely flammable from the neck up, I am going to just do a quick bit of uh, cleansing water. I washed my face this morning, but I've been out since then, and that just feels gross. So a little bit of moisturizer. I'm not talking about any of the products that I'm using just because I feel like, first of all, nobody's paying me, so uh, I'm not going to give that away for free. Second of all, I generally am not of the opinion that the products that I'm using are the products that are going to be good for you. I worked at Sephora for a couple of years, and so a lot of this stuff I got either for free or for a really steep discount. Other things are just things that I picked up randomly that I'm trying for the first time. They might not even necessarily work the best for me. So I'm not 
advocating any products. If you see me using any products and you like them, that's fine. But they are neither sponsors, nor am I specifically saying that they are good. That's why I'm not talking about them. Don't feel like you need to pay too close attention to the product or the techniques. Not a professional makeup artist. I worked at Sephora in the skincare section. <laughs> Primer. Okay. Uh, something that was really important for me when realizing that this was definitely more of a cosplay than it was a costume that I was creating is I realized that I could make any 17th century gown and it would be a 17th century gown regardless. So it came down to things that I was making in the little details, the accessories. So that's what I'm mostly going to be talking about in the context of my making the accessories is how they related to the character of Ella and sometimes fit into the 17th century historical oeuvre. It's not something that I would necessarily uh, say is totally accurate. I tried more to evoke the 17th century with the accessories rather than actually do them accurately because I was trying to do Ella. I wasn't trying to do 17th century exclusively. I made a lot of flowers for Ella. A love of nature and the earth are factors that play huge roles in Ella Enchanted. Nearly every race of mythical beings in the story, excepting the ogres, are in some way associated with like a love of nature and a reverence for, for nature. That felt important to me. Um, the gnomes proverbs are all about digging in the earth. Uh, the giant's marriage ceremony involves a lot of agricultural farming elements, and uh, the elves are nothing but creatures of the forest like that's their whole thing is that they're very like naturey beings and with the elves who are very special despite not being really significant to the plot all of their sculpted items have this really beautiful sort of magic quality to them kind of trick you into believing that they're real and that aspect of the magic of Ella Enchanted, which is very quiet and subtle in most ways, is really interesting to me. And so that's what I wanted to emulate in the accessories of this project. I was reminded how much I love sculpting by this project. I sculpted a lot in, in high school. It was one of my favorite things to do in our art class, but I never really did it after that because I was never in a position after that to be readily supplied with materials. Yeah, so I, I, I started sculpting again for this project uh, out of a desire not to crumble under the weight of, <laughs> of the accessories. I decided to make them out of foam clay, and uh, it's real weird, guys. Uh, foam clay is real weird. This is totally a new substance to me, and it was such a lot of fun to work with. I used a combination of hand sculpting and silicone molds to create the flowers, and I used those to decorate the mask and the tiara. I also used uh, foam clay to create the fake pearls and the filigree detail that go into the mask. Okay, the one exception I'm going to make to talking about product or talking about uh, brands is this is not the branded Beauty Blender sponge tool. This is just an off-brand thing. Um, do not, do not, do not feel like you have to get the branded version of this. I really, really hate how much the Beauty Blender costs. If you feel like you are losing out somehow because you can't buy the like $35 in Canada, at least, Beauty Blender, then like, no, don't. It's, this is fine. I got this at a drugstore. The last accessory that I made uh, for this project was my uh, little lilac hairpiece. That was the last accessory that I made for this project out of foam clay. I knew at this point that my fabric was going to be primary lilac shades, and I'd already been trying to think of ways to incorporate lilac into the project because of the association with Ella and uh, the fairy Lucinda, who smells of lilacs. It wasn't hard, it was just, you know, you had to do it a bunch of times and eventually you got good at it. But yeah, it was, it was kind of lovely. Um, I was really pleased with it. Personal side note, I love lilacs deeply. They grow very large in Canada. They're not really a um, flower. They're more of a flowering shrub. They grow like weeds and they're practically a pest for how hard they are to get rid of. But I love them to bits because they bloom right around the end of May, which is near my birthday. And so around my birthday, it always smells like lilacs. Yeah, they're a weirdly constructed flower, so I found an online tutorial to help me put it together, but like the way that I could describe it is their stems are very woody, they're, they're not flowers so much as they are like a spray of little blooms all on one kind of big bunch, and that's not exactly something you can knock out of a silicone mold, which is why I ended up finding this tutorial online for how to uh, sculpt them by hand. L yeah, lilac branches tend to have a lot of different stages of growth and stages of bloom, on them at any one time. So I feel like that also was a very interesting challenge of arranging all of those various states of bloom and those different stages of open flowers onto a single accessory. 
All of the items that I made with foam clay were treated afterwards with a uh, Plasti Dip. This is used for a bunch of different reasons, but in my case it was used to prevent uh, paint from being absorbed into the foam. I used acrylic paint, and then uh, for most of the detail pieces on top of the acrylic paint, I mixed an acrylic satin glaze with Pearl X pigments to give it all a very pearly, magical feeling. I wanted everything to sort of glow in candlelight and have a nice soft shimmer to it. I didn't want anything to be too matte. I'd never constructed a tiara before. I'd never made any kind of a, this kind of accessory before, so I was a little lost in the woods, honestly. I uh, I couldn't find a ton of examples uh, from historical reference that I could follow, but I did manage to find a couple of online uh, tutorials that are contemporary, and when I found those, I just sort of opted for my own design choices. Like at this point, it was an Ella tiara, not a 17th century tiara. So I opted for a wire frame just to have something for all of the uh, little flower accessories to stick onto. Most of the modern tutorials either did it freehand or created the created a jig with a preset pattern that you looped the wire around. So I made myself a jig. This is the Liz way. If you don't have it, make it. For everyone exclaiming in the comments now about the sacrilegious use of a book, y'all can calm the heck down. I'm sure we'll be able to find another poor quality printing of samples of the poetry of Thackeray and Huxley. Life will go on. So the jig acted as a frame uh, for the wire loops, which I then removed the wire loops from it to manipulate a little bit more by hand with pliers and fix the whole thing together with the same floral wire that I'd used for the lilac piece. I tied it all to a metal hairband that I wasn't using. Then I went pretty hog wild with the flowers. I, if I had made a prettier frame for the tiara, I might have been a little bit gentler, but as it was, the wire frame turned into something of a disaster. So a mass of roses on top of a section of leaves, it was, yay. <laughs> So yeah, making the mask was a whole lot of fun because making the mask entailed using plaster strips, which were soaked in water and then placed over my face. First, best practice, I'm gonna say it right off in case anybody forgets or that I forget to say it later, throw on a thick layer of really emollient cream. It absolutely has to be really greasy. Uh, we don't keep petroleum jelly in the house. I used a similar product that I get from a I think it's the Lush's Ultra Bomb, although it could have been a cold cream from LBCC. Either one, both of those are great, but either way, highly, highly like oily, creamy. You don't want to be, you don't want to be too casual about this particular one because otherwise all the hair is going to come off your face. It's just going to be gross. Faster strips go on your face. You let it dry for a few minutes on your face, like a half hour, say. Yeah, you can feel it sort of coming away from your face eventually, uh, and you can kind of move your nose and stuff, and you feel confident that the mask at that point is going to stay relatively in place. That's the time to uh, to take it off, but take it off real slow. And then once you're done, it's not ready yet. It still needs to dry. It's just dry enough to get off your face. Then it'll dry for a few days elsewhere. And then at this point, I could have done a whole bunch of different things depending on what I needed and what I wanted. I covered it in a layer of foam clay, and then I waited for that to dry another couple of days. And then I dremeled down to as smooth as possible while getting it as thin as possible, especially around the edges. I wanted that to be nice and smooth. I didn't want that big lumpy chunky business. Uh, I also used the dremel to adjust the eye shapes. Uh, all of the pieces similarly on the mask as on the tiara were plasti dipped and then painted with acrylic paint and then glued all together. So in the case of most of it, it was white glue or super glue, depending on what materials were being stuck to what. Generally speaking, honestly, like white glue works surprisingly well for most things, especially if it dries clear as most white glue does. But yeah, it's yeah, it was plasti dipped and painted like the tiara pieces. Then a length of ribbon was added to each side of it so that I could tie it to the back of my head. And that was a hole that again, I drilled with the Dremel. All right, to contour or not to contour? Yeah, anyways, the um, the pearls around my neck and in my hair were, were mostly actually derived from uh, historical sources. People were huge on pearls in the 17th century, and the pearls themselves were huge. Uh, so that was a lot of inspiration that I had from various portraiture of how to, uh, how to incorporate pearls, mostly in the hair, which was really cool. I was already painting everything with a kind of pearlescent finish, and so having actual pearls be incorporated, not actual pearls, they're fake, but like pearls in the sense of pearls, uh, was kind of cool because then I could, yeah, I could fit it eas more easily into the historical 
nature of the costume, which was fun. These, the historical nature of the costume and the cosplay nature of the costume actually really complemented each other really well over the course of the project. Because when I was unsure about one, I could go to the other. When they coincided, it was a lovely bit of kismet. And other than that, they didn't clash too much ever. There were a couple of times when I felt like maybe, you know, I could have done a little bit more in one or the other. But frankly, on the whole, it was a really great experience to have them play off of each other. That was really cool. The hair is also era specific. That was not a choice I made based on Ella Enchanted. That was a choice I made based on portraiture. And despite Abby's insistence of the period hair being sort of spanially, which I can't deny, uh, it still looked amazing. Over the course of studying and researching the era, the more I looked into it, the more I was just absolutely fascinated. I don't think it's that bad looking. I think it's really nice. Uh, I really love the look of it. Um, I kind of fell in love with the hair the more I looked at portraits while doing this research. I don't know if that's just exposure or what, but I really love the look. Uh, the decorations were arranged in the style that was popular at the time with the pearls dipping back into the chignon and then uh, some pearls wrapped around the chignon bun. The chignon was done with a, uh, a, a just a little hair donut. I tight curled my front curls just with some foam rollers, really, and then brushed them out first thing in the morning. And then I really coated them with uh, some hair balm, also from LBCC. Um, and it gave it this beautiful gloss, because that was a very popular thing at the time, was to have that like those glossy ringlets. And then decorated, yeah, everything, as I said, with the, with the strings of pearls. And now we're on to the makeup. Uh, the makeup was a whole different thing. Um, I did a lot of research into the 17th century kind of styles of makeup, and there were two major uh, trends. One for the painted look that we think of when we think of like Queen Elizabeth in the late Tudor era, as well as uh, even into the 18th century a little bit. But there was also a sort of powdery look, which was a little bit lighter touch. And I decided to go with that, seeing as we were talking about a more natural approach overall for Ella. But also, I just didn't want to have to spend all that time and energy, especially when I was going to be wearing a mask. So what I ended up doing was this lightly powdery look, which was uh, a stain for uh, lips and cheeks, also provided by LBCC. Then uh, just a translucent powder that I already have over top of newly moisturized skin. So I would say that if you're doing that powdered look, pro tip, get yourself some cold cream or some kind of like really heavy duty moisturizer, not the light kind that you put on before you go out during the day, the stuff that you put on at night that sort of sits on your skin and you feel moisturized in the morning, but you also feel like you really need to like wash your face, like that kind of texture. That does a really great job of holding that powder in a way that looks powdery. And, like I can't even explain how, uh, how much easier it is if you've got something like that. Otherwise you end up having to put on some sort of base or foundation just so that the powder stays, which is, you know, kind of defeating the whole purpose, so. And then with the eyes, I couldn't really do, first of all, there isn't much that you can do in terms of historical accuracy with eyes. They didn't do much eye painting at that point, but the mask presents a unique challenge in that way um, because, like, I don't know if you've ever seen people wearing masquerade masks where they haven't properly prepared their face, but the eyes end up looking real weird. Like, especially if you can see somebody's skin color in the eye hole area, it just, it's kind of creepy and I don't like it. So I'm gonna pause really quick to do this uh, lip liner and then I'll be right back. And we're back. Um, if you know, somebody can explain to me what that phenomena is in the comments uh, when it comes to why it's so creepy to see people's eye skin or the skin around their eyes when they're wearing a mask. But uh, uh, what I ended up doing was I opted for a dark shadow around the top of my eyes. And that was really just for the photography, not to creep anybody out. I don't know that I succeeded, but maybe next time. Just these these accessory items for this costume and the uh, final look was just so much more of a Hail Mary shot in the dark than anything else I did in January for this project. The more I went and learned the more ideas I had. I couldn't believe how much I managed to actually accomplish and how it turned out. Like, I, it really excites me to think about the fact that I haven't even been doing this hobby, this historical costuming thing for more than two, like I haven't even been doing it for two years yet. So just imagine how many more things I have to learn just by keeping going at it. Oh, I'm realizing that this entire time I've been giving you a nice juicy shot of my hairy armpits. Um, if you care, um, y'all can jump in a lake because I don't care. Ooh, eyebrows. Crap. 
I hope you enjoyed this. Um, both the making stuff and the uh, sort of change of scenery and shooting style. Uh, this was so much fun for me to get to get to do and change up the way that I do things. If you've uh, if I've done what I've meant to, then this will be the third video in three weeks. And oh boy, do I really hope that I can get myself uh, a little bit of a buffer with that uh, head start and then uh, maybe keep up that trend. I cannot guarantee, but I really, really hope I can because that'd be really great. I love being able to update more often if I could. Uh, yeah, no, no promises in that department, but we'll see what we can do. Um, if you'd like to help me out in getting my stuff out faster, one of the ways that you can do that is uh, supporting me on Patreon or with Ko-fi donations. Uh, being able to afford to make these videos is as much a part of it as actually having the time to make these videos. And if I don't have to be spending time on other things, I, uh, I can spend more time on videos, I can get better equipment that will allow me to uh, do things faster, more efficiently, I might be able to get somebody to uh, do my subtitles for me, for example, which is a big part of uh, any upload day. If you uh, if you'd like to support me on Patreon or Ko-fi, the links are below. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you to all of my current patrons and Ko-fi donors. Um, you're all amazing. Thank you so much now to film a parody of Dr. Strangelove before a historical costuming video about how I'd learned to love cosplay. Do you ever just stop and think, my life is really weird? <laughs>